With all this overhead, I thought I would tell a one-liner from Steve Wright, who is my idol, right? What is the speed of dark? <laughs> oh, come on. Half of you didn't laugh, what are you? That's really funny. Alex, you get that? If Alex laughs, it's really basic. <laughs> Do you have any photos of the inside of this guy that you could share with us? The inside of Richard Saul Worman? If anybody Imagine at, that. If anybody was at Ted Med in Philadelphia, in the second page of the program, I had four pictures of my colonoscopy. <laughs> And the punchline is? Well, that I'm everybody's asshole. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you see? We're going to have fun. Go ahead. OK, what are we going to talk about? This is Richard Saul Worman, and I'm going to ask him some questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's start off a little seriously. Is this going on? Yeah, that's okay. going on. It's okay. OK. Your latest project, and we'll work backwards in terms of your earliest project, your latest project is well, 19, 2021. Right, and I presented some of that last year briefly, and uh, I could give an update on what's happened. It's yeah, gone slower yeah. than I hope. We always hope things go faster. Yeah. But it's a very long project, and it's a very simple project. It's not a do-gooder project. It's simply to, you know, uh, allow me to understand something that I'm curious about, and that is I can't understand the cities of the world because there are no two cities in the world that collect their information asking the same questions or displaying it in the same way, and all maps are, the different, are different scales. So you can't actually, if you wanted to find out how to compare Shanghai to Sao Paulo, you can't. Now, you might not want to do that, but I want to do that. Uh, I would like to understand the urbanized world as a, as, a, as a beginning. I don't want to change things necessarily, I just want to understand. If people by understanding want to change things or helps them change things, that's fine. But it's really to develop a methodology of understanding comparatively the urban areas of the world which constitute now 51% of the population of the world and make it transparent so any city of any size can collect their information and display their information in a comparable fashion. And yeah. you only understand something relative to something you understand. <laughs> Choke on that a little bit, you'll see it's true. Uh, so that's what this is, and it's in several modalities. There's going to be a large exhibit in spring of 2010 that's going to open in Singapore. There are going to be 19 urban observatories in the 19 cities that we're choosing. There will be 19 conferences around the world. Those will be, we'll be helped on that by the uh, Field Museum in Chicago. We're going to have 19 conferences around the world, uh, which I hope uh, my friend down here from Monitor Group will help us on. And uh, one of my partners is uh, the Radical Media, and they're going to develop a television show, and we'll have a website. Uh, so we don't have a working title for it, but it'll be like Google Earth or Planet Earth for people, you know, not frogs. And, um, and what else is there? That's all the... Oh, and books. Of course, I do books. So yeah. there'll be a book on each city and then slices through every subject, so a book on sewer system. I mean, dull stuff, but on the patterns. The word pattern came up by one person here today, and it really is the fundamental issue in understanding and in creativity is understanding and seeing new patterns. Yeah. So we hope we see new patterns. That's it. That was fast. I said it fast. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. And I have four partners, and they're fantastic. Uh, and where are they in the work? Well, we're trying to collect $50 million. It's not a good time. Uh -huh. um, it's an expensive project uh, to do this. Um, so I wasn't aware that you were in the fundraising thing, so that's an oh, important yeah. fact. Uh, part of the reason yeah. for doing that, and then in about a month, we have a, a, a deck of about 100 screens that will be coming up, and a film <coughs> all done by Radical Media that oh. is really exquisite, really terrific. Radical Media, uh, John Kamen and uh, Bobby Friedman are, are uh, two of my partners, Michael Hawley, who uh, some of you know, and is the Van Clyburn winner in uh, uh, amateur uh, piano playing, and he's a... Uh, what else? He uh, was head of special projects for the Media Lab, and uh, he did the largest book ever done, the book on Bhutan of photographs. He's a really smart guy, and he's running EG this year, which is a spin-off conference that I had started. Yeah. And, um, and then Larry Keeley, who uh, is part of the Monitor Group, but wasn't when we first came on board on this, and is in Chicago, uh, head of the Doblin Group. Yeah. Okay. 
So it's good people. They're all smart. They're all great people. Yeah, they're smart guys. Okay. Let's talk about another smart guy, Gutenberg. 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 This is a plant question because I love Gutenberg. Um, but the, the one thing I'll come up with in this, well, I just went and did an homage uh, to Gutenberg. I went to Mons, Germany, uh, about a month and a half ago. And as you know, uh, in the Western world, he invented mov movable type. And uh, uh, he invented the movable. He carved the, the type, 126 letters. Uh, uh, so they're perfectly spaced. It's the, also the combination of every two letters. John Warnock, who, as many of you know, started uh, Adobe, who's in the type business a little bit, and uh, he said uh, that no book has ever been set in type better than, uh, they can't set it as well, with any computer equipment as Gutenberg did in his first Bible. Um, he invented uh, the printing press with his brother, uh, and then did the ink, because he had to have a special ink for a printing press, and, uh, and the paper. And, uh, he did that all, him, all himself. Quite an extraordinary achievement. Uh, and it took 99 years after the first Gutenberg Bible for somebody to come up with pagination. <laughs> that is not a trivial thing. Yeah, think about that. Think of what it means. Yeah. Tr pagination was the precursor to Google. It's finding something. Search. Search. And it was 99 years after the Bible. We, the, first, the first books were not about finding anything. They, they, it was the Bible. It was a different purpose of communication. 99 years, and then somebody who I can't find out their name, but I can find out the reference. Somebody will find it out after this conference. Um, I'm not, I don't have an attention span that allows me to do that. Um, Send us but, both an email, whoever. Yeah. But that's a, a pagination. Thing. Seriously, think about that. Yeah. What pagination is? Okay, next. Yeah. Okay, we're going down this list. Here we go. We'll bounce around a little bit, but how about this quote? I think it's your quote. Understanding what it is not to understand. Yeah. The best presenters today, and that's not every one of them, but the best yeah. ones, as part of their very nature, understand what it's like not to understand. So when they talk to you, you can understand what they're talking about. It's a gift. And most of us have the disease of familiarity. So you leap over on trying to understand what it's like not to understand and talk about that pattern to bring somebody in. Uh, and then you never communicate. We've all had those professors. Very smart, but we don't understand a goddamn thing they say. Because they, stopped, they didn't do that first step. That's, I won't mention names. That's, in many ways, the essence of storytelling. Mm -hmm. To provide context, to context provide connection. Context and bring you in. When you told your story about your, your mother-in-law, we, we, could, we could draw us in. We could identify with mm. us. Identify with the person, the relationship, which we thought, we fantasized. It brought us in. And that's the beautiful thing about storytelling. It relaxes us to come in and be part of the story. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we've learned something. Yeah. That's good. More? Good? Yeah, come on. Let's okay. see. He's going to do the friggin' okay. hook. <laughs> friggin' hook? You started the friggin' hook. So, uh, <laughs> I know. Okay, let's go to, well, look, we're at a conference. You started, Ted. You're a man who knows conferences. What is the secret of a great conference? What's interesting about Ted is I, I sold it in 2002, and I just went back for the first time uh, this last, a year ago. And uh, there had been some hostility between the person I sold to and myself. And he invited me back, and we patched it up, and we were on stage. And it's a fantastic conference. It's really a fantastic conference. It's the best conference still. It's a little different, but a lot of DNA is still good DNA is there. It's an amazing event. Everybody wants to go. And here's the interesting story. Everybody is in this room, and the fact is you don't have to be. Everybody, all these people want to get into TED and pay, spend a lot of money, and they don't have to, because he created uh, uh, TED Talks. Yeah. One of the best websites that, one well, of the best websites on the web, period. It's an amazing website where you can see the whole conference in the privacy of your own home, office, wherever you are. All the talks. So, all the one. talks, the best talks, and all of them. And I'm in the process of giving them, I have digital tape, tape from 1984 to 2002. 2001, and I'm giving them all the back talks, so those are going to go up. Uh, the EG talks are going on there. 
Ted Med, which I'm, I've done four, and I've now turned it over to Mark Odosh. Part of my agreement of giving it to Mark is to, that he has to put the talks from, we haven't told Chris this yet, <laughs> but put them on, give them the offer to put yep. them on uh, Ted Talks if yep. they want. Because I think it's the right thing to do. I think TED Talks is such an amazing site that the best of the best should be there. If we have talks from the conferences that we do with Monitor Group, and I hope we do that, the best of that, I'm just going to give it to them. They don't want to use them, I'll put them up someplace else. But they want to use them. The best of what people say should be available. But then, still, everybody wants to go there. That's right. They want to touch the flesh. They want to be there. Nothing beats being there and talking to somebody. So why is that? I don't know. I just don't know, but it's, it's, it's worlds a bit better than a... You and I, when we talk privately, is better than talking now. But this is okay, but it was better than that, because I'm sort of just talking to you. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm in the front of the stage so I can sort of see some sweat on somebody's brow, not so far back, which is dumb. Uh, you should be right close to who you're talking to. You should, you should worry about them spitting. Um, but then a phone call isn't nearly as good. Not nearly as good. Email's not nearly as good. Yeah. There's some teleconferencing things by HP and, uh, and Cisco that are pretty good. Oh, the halo of the telephone. But they cost a friggin' fortune, and you both have to have them. It's like the old fax machine. When I went to see, yeah. uh, years ago, when I went to see uh, Mickey uh, Schulhoff when he was running uh, uh, Sony in New York before he was fired, yeah. um, I went in to see him, we were talking, and he said, uh, oh, I'll send you that stuff on a fax. I said, Mickey, I don't have a fax machine. This is, nobody had a fax machine. Yeah. And, uh, well, you can't be a player if you don't have a fax <laughs> machine. So I went, out and bought a, I went out and bought a fax machine, you know, about the same time I bought a house in the Hamptons. And uh, <laughs> so I got a fax machine, and very soon everybody had a fax machine. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing. So, but that wasn't so expensive. Yeah. But these other things are very expensive. When they're not so expensive, they're not bad. I've, I've been with Jeffrey Katzenberg when we did a conference like that yeah. uh, with England. Yeah. It was quite yeah. amazing. Yeah, this but, is the but, Halo one, right? Yeah, the Halo one. But it's yeah. 100,000 bucks, 200,000 bucks, a million bucks, whatever it is. It's for, the first yeah. ones were very expensive. Yeah, yeah. But they're pretty amazing. If you haven't tried one, you see one demoed someplace, go and see it. It's worth it. Definitely. I've done the, the Halo one. Yeah. And uh, this is what I'm trying to extract from you. With the Halo, tell a, you know, we were talking to someone in... Three or four people you can talk yeah. to and feel like they're right there. But it's like talking, it's like basically there's a, a pane of glass. But, uh, and they're across the world or something like that. And uh, the emotion is there, yeah. okay? The emotion is there. And I think that's what we're talking, yeah. that's what I'm trying to get yeah. at. There's a certain amount of chemistry, well, you get the nuance. emotion. You get the nuance. The nuance, the communication of, of, that comes of, with of the facial face. facial expression, yeah, you get yeah. all that. Yeah. You know? They're pretty good, they're pretty good. Yeah. There's another third one, uh, uh, whatchamacallit has one up in Pasadena too. Uh, I'm losing his name, but I'll think of it in a minute. You know, if they could bring that down to Twenty, thirty thousand dollars, or something like that, or whatever it is. Well, they will. It, they will. It, you know. They were going to, if gas, if uh, uh, if a barrel of oil is three hundred dollars. Yeah. They would have more teleconferencing. Yeah. No, that's true. Because but think no, I mean, there's had, an effect you know, of one thing or another. No, yeah. it's true. But think if we had them in our homes. Well, it should be more than three hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, well that, like that's that. what I heard. You yeah. know, it's the pipe. But they're you pretty wonderful. Pipe. You've done them, obviously. Yeah. 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 yeah or you wouldn't it. know that piece of trivia. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he has one? Yeah, okay. Go so, uh, so let's go on to something more personal. You asked me during, uh, it's not so personal. You asked me during the presentation earlier, one of the presentations earlier, am I elderly? And, and oh, I, yeah. I just said you're an old fart. Yeah. But that's not what you meant. No. And well, what is they were thrown around elderly before, and they were throwing around 60 years old, 65 years old. I'm 73, and I want to know, am I elderly? I think you ought to define what elderly is. And the definition should be a performance definition, not just an age. I know it's inconvenient just to use it, uh, to use, uh, you know, it's convenient to use an age, but it's not really the measure of things. And you really yeah. should talk about nursing homes in terms of incontinence because that's a high percentage of people going into nursing homes because of incontinence, and not because they couldn't help themselves or be helped at home, but because nobody knows how to do it. So part of going into nursing homes because of incontinence is lack of information. Yeah. And uh, the mystique of not knowing your body, which you should do something on incontinence. 
It affects so many, you are, of course. If I, no matter what I came up with, he said he is. <laughs> and then he gets on his friggin' phone and says, do incontinence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I ran that one out. I, I want to play that out. No, no, yeah, I don't okay. think you did. Uh, again, I, I've been. Well, studying... I told you the duality of 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 the elderly or uh, people who go into nursing homes and as you get older. And I'd done all the research uh, and twelve years ago for a book on a day in the life of uh, somebody who is you know, basically 80 or over, but not that age, who has failing parts of their brain, mind, body, whatever. And the idea is if you look at a book, two pages in a book, on one side, let's just take incontinence. On one side, it tells you, as, as uh, Alexander would, uh, what's happening to yourself? What's inside your body? What's going wrong? What can you do for yourself? What are the kind of uh, things you can do for yourself to help you with the embarrassment of of incontinence, or sphincter exercises, which you can do. Various things you can do, what you can eat or shouldn't eat, or how you should lie in bed, or whatever. Yeah. Right? Tells you about yourself. On the other side of the page is exactly the same thing through the eyes of the caregiver. Not the care receiver, but the caregiver. What can you do for this person? Demystify it, so maybe they, you just don't throw them in the nursing home if you're a loved one or so. Yeah. And that every part of the day, getting out of bed, getting dressed, making a meal, things that were shown, is looked at in the Rashomon way. Look at the same thing, two completely different ways. The same moment, two different ways, as a way of understanding things better. You know, it's, it, I really it would like be useful. That. I really like that. And you could do it for, any, for a whole list of things. Yeah. You could do it for eating, you could do it for dressing, for the Absolutely. things that we're talking yeah. about. For all of that, from, from both perspectives. And Many to have of us both have relatives that. that don't like, I mean, I don't know about your wives and husbands or kids, but some people don't want to be touched when they're not feeling well. Yeah. A lot of people aren't good care receivers. Care receivers, a lot of people I aren't, like that. Aren't good caregivers. Yeah. They don't want to see somebody they love being sick, and they, 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 they get, make them nervous. And so I'm these like, could actually be this personal. Just these could be personal. demystifies mm -hmm. that so that they can bridge the gap. The gutter of the book is the gap. I like that. When is this coming out? Huh. You've been I working have on this I, for a long oh, time. I know, but I, uh, but this I is have really drawers important. full of dumb ideas. No, 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 no. This is important. That's all I do is this dumb is ideas. Every book I do is a dumb idea. This is, this is a dumb idea, 19, 20, 21. I mean, what could be dumber than doing maps the same scale? Hello? I mean, this is not an esoteric academic idea. That's why it hasn't been done. I really mean that. Go ahead, next question. Oh, I told you a little thing that I thought of. This is clever. I thought of this a week ago because somebody and I just told uh, Randy Anik, uh, Anik about it the other, yesterday. Uh, somebody asked me a question about uh, what's the big influences or who was I in some, like, some interview. Or the, and I thought of this image that I am the tango. This is just a week old, so I'll have to keep on pulling this one out. But I said, I am the tango. Tango is romantic, it's a little violent, it's beautiful, the musicality is wonderful. You don't touch any, you don't touch the, your partner. It's very disciplined. And the two partners are curiosity and ignorance. And that's who I am. I am passionate about my curiosity and I am completely in embrace with my ignorance. Uh, I am more in embrace with my ignorance than anybody in this room. Nobody knows how ignorant they are, as much as I do. <laughs> I am really in this hug with my own void, that I am really stupid. And my curiosity wants me to fill it up about each thing that interests me. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what separates me from the people who try to look smart, which is most people in this room. Yeah. They're all trying to look smart from the stage. Even. Yeah. You know, I'm they're sorry, not so I smart. keep looking at you in terms of tango. <laughs> so, well, I like that. It's a very interesting exercise. We should all ask ourselves, you know, if we had to pick a dance, who we are. So, pick a dance. Um, well, that gets yeah. to high school. Well, you started this. No, I just high school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's Jeez. go on for. Uh, which one is this? This is a good one. Oh, you wrote a fable. Ah, 
I wrote a fable in 1975, which was presented in 1976, because I was national chairman of the AIA convention in Philadelphia. Big birthday, 200th anniversary of America, and I was chairman of the conference. So even I couldn't um, uh, be the keynote speaker, because I didn't have that level of braggadocio at that time. It was early. It was early. 75, 76 was early. So I wrote a fable. And the fable took place in a, mystic, a mythical town called What If, in the country of could be. Yeah. Uh, what if, comma, could be. And they hired a, um, a, a person to run the town. They gave him all power for a year. And he was the commissioner of curiosity and imagination. And <laughs> all the drawings were done by R.O. Blackman. I won't explain to you who it is if you don't know. Um, and what he did in his year of office with all these powers was to do the opposite of everything was going on. So in the, the guy who gave that talk about music, he ch his first act was the, he changed the laws of copyright to the right to copy. And the only thing you couldn't, uh, there was, you know, the only thing that you could copyright were bad ideas. <laughs> and he zoned all the, well. Sorry. It's a fable. It's good. Uh, he, changed, he stopped all the building of schools, all the bricks and mortar. And if you built over five or six stories, you had to make the top floor a classroom and the ground floor a kind of museum of what and why everybody did what they did in the building. So you walk through the city, and you have, it's an urban observatory, an urban schoolhouse. And you go up, all the kids go up through the building, and the classrooms are all through the city on the tops of buildings. Yeah. Right? And you didn't spend money for bricks and mortar. And so he closed most of the departments of the city. He changed the, the rules of uh, zoning to zoning of public properties uh, rather than private properties, so there was no zoning uh, variations. Um, he set up urban observatories to make, because he did the public information should be made public act. Uh, think about that. Public information should be made public, accessible, understandable, available. Yeah. Think of how fundamental that is, and we don't do it. Public information be made public. Nothing's yeah. very public about our information because yeah. it's not understandable. And when it is public, you can't understand it. It's public, you can't understand it. And um, well, he went on doing many, many things, and that the uh, and then the fable ended. And then recently, somebody wanted me to republish it, and I said I wouldn't, uh, but I would do additions to it. I would do a new fable because it was 33 years ago. So I'm doing a new fable, which is going to the first one is going to be reproduced in facsimile because it was little. And around there's going to be big white margins. And the white margins are going to have his, the updated fable, what happened 33 years. Well, at the end of the fable, they banished him, of course, because everything was working too well. And they banished him to the hardest place to get to on Earth, which is in Micronesia, the Car Carolina area of the South, Southern Pacific and the Micronesia. Uh, I'll be home soon. Um, and uh, 470 kilometers south of Ponape is a little atoll. Uh, called Kapangi Morongi. That's the truth. Everything I'm telling you is the truth, really. And a ship goes there, a freighter from Ponape, once a month. And um, so they went to Ponape. They, they drank some of the, the hallucinatory drink that they drink on Ponape. That's the truth, too. And um, they had to wait a week or so to pick up the freighter. The freighter went down. They got off, and they tried to convince the, uh, the commissioner who lived on this island for 33 years and now had 33 children. And they all look somewhat like him. And um, they convinced him to come back. And he didn't really want to because he really, loved the, he really loved his life there. But they talked to him, talked to him. And the thing that brought him back was television. <laughs> he really missed television. And he missed black and white television, but he missed television. And uh, so he got on the boat, and the boat took him back, and he went back. And then the new part of the fable is his observations of what had happened in 33 years. Uh, some good, some bad. Many of his preconceptions different. Yeah. Uh, and many of them put off. The, uh, the change in copyright was slowly creeping in. Mm. And it was becoming part of society because of what we just heard. Yes. Not only in music, but in everything. Yep. Uh, but that was slow, slow to happen. That was a technological change, not a change from the heart or because it was the right thing to do. Yeah. In fact, just the opposite of that. It was kind of on, it was a demand that happened. 
what he thought was really wonderful was choice when he left. Mm. And then he went through a supermarket and felt the choice wasn't so good. That you don't need 100 different waters and 100 different beers. And that the language was really hurt by the trivializing of certain words like free or buy one, get one free, which was a lie. You just pay half price for that particular product. Uh, there's a number of things like that that were, were not good and everything was free of magnesium or free of salt or free of water fat. Water is free of salt. Yeah, we have water is free. Things that never had things in them in the first place were free yeah, of it. Exactly. As free was a reason to buy everything when we all know nothing's free. Exactly. And then it's his experiences yeah. of in other places, yeah. uh, in the school system, in, yeah. in the, with the police department, with things that he left and talked about in the first round of yeah. the fable. Yeah. And uh, so that's going to come out sometime yeah. soon. There's a, there's a book coming out by Chris Anderson, the other Chris Anderson, on free. Oh, good. So you should check that out. I will. When it comes out. I We're will. almost there. Not quite. You were talking earlier about a new department, Department of Wanting oh, to Oh, that was be one of, that was, that's in the first fable. The only department he did, he closed all these other departments, but he started one new department, and that has to do with the nursing home, too, somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, the one new department was the Department of Waiting to be Wanted. And the Department of Waiting to be Wanted was dedicated to old people and old buildings. <laughs> and um, that was a success. Well, you can repurpose both of them. Is that it? Three minutes are up, I'm off. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Thank you very much, guys. Oh, we were going to you were going to talk about we did talk about conferences. So that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>